You are listening to What It's Like with Luce, a podcast highlighting ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Lucy Norris, and on today's episode, I'm chatting to CEO and founder of Goss.ie. Stepping onto the stage at age six, this week's guest has been in love with the glitz and glam of the entertainment world for as long as she can remember. Religiously watching award shows, she could have never imagined a few years down the line she'd be hosting her very own version in Dublin's Mansion House and sitting shoulder to shoulder with celebs and media moguls alike. Having a natural knack for journalism, it was no surprise the ambitious young entrepreneur spent her early 20s taking the Irish industry by storm, winning Showbiz Journalist of the Year at just 22 years old. Working for The Herald, presenting a slot on Expose and writing features at the Mail on Sunday, it was after being denied an editor position in 2014 that she took a leap of faith and launched her very own entertainment news outlet, Goss.ie. Sharing her thoughts on the harshness of the industry, the secret to her success and gender inequality in business, here's what it's like to be Alexandra Ryan. Before we get stuck into the episode, I just wanted to say that if there is a drop in sound quality throughout, I'm very sorry, but in respect of social distancing during COVID-19, I've had to record episodes remotely. In this challenging time, we're all trying our best, so I really hope everyone is staying safe and that you enjoy the episode. Welcome, Ali. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. Um, I think it would be a really nice starting point if we could just go all the way back for a second and chat a little bit about um, the experiences you had growing up and um, I guess how that led to you forming a career within um, entertainment and entertainment reporting. Yeah, that's such a funny question. Um, God, I know people always ask me, like, especially when we're at the Gossies, one year literally Nikki Byrne turned to me and he was like, did you dream of all this, like, when you were a kid? And honestly, not really. Like, I don't think I knew what I was going to do, but I always knew it was going to be something big. Like, I always... I was always chasing something big. I always felt that way. So when I was in school, I used to always write short stories. I used to write poems. Like I used to add, I used to enter poetry competitions and stuff like that. So I knew I loved writing. Um, and then I don't know if you remember or if you've ever seen in Home Alone, there's like um, Macaulay Culkin plays with this like tape recorder and he like records everyone throughout the movie. And I actually got the real version of that when I was a kid. And I used to go around no interviewing like my teachers and stuff. I'm sure it was so annoying. <laughs> I used to like hide in the bushes and like try to be a detective and like write things down. So it's funny when I look back at that because I'm like, oh, that's hilarious. Like there was a journalist in me there somewhere, which I didn't, I wouldn't have realized that at the time. But my mom used to always say when I was really young, she thought I was going to be an author, like that I was going to end up kind of that route but I also loved like singing and dancing and musical theatre and stuff I did that for years like I started acting classes when I was about six and then I did musical theatre for like six years like stage school and then I was in the Gaty School of Acting as well so definitely when I was younger I just wanted the life of like glamour I think the show business world I don't think I knew exactly what it was but I was interested in like red carpet events like I was obsessed with the Oscars and like the Golden Globes and back then there was no websites or anything but I would love like Hello Magazine and OK Magazine and like all that kind of stuff I was always so interested in that um, and like even like for my I want to say 10th birthday I asked for a typewriter like that's the present that I got so it's weird like at the time I don't think I knew what I was kind of building up to do but clearly now when I look back I'm like right I was writing from like day one like I've had diaries all my life as well like from the age of about five onwards like it's wow. mental so I was always writing I was always really really imaginative loved acting loved singing loved the spotlight in general I think I was just mad to kind of do something that wasn't normal so like obviously other people would dream of doing different things but I like wanted to be on stage I wanted to be a part of kind of all the madness basically but I was really badly bullied in school like um so I grew up in Dublin so I was 12 and then we moved to Limerick so I I spent my teens and my college years in Limerick before I moved back to Dublin but um I always say now that kind of having all those really difficult times as a teenager made me really want to prove myself to people and I think that's why I ended up being really like ambitious and kind of led me to where I am now. Yeah I definitely say it helped with I guess resilience and stuff too but I just think from your story it's so mad how almost full circle you've come and how you've created that world that you wanted to live in so badly when you were younger for yourself. So funny when you say it like that because I thought I've literally only had that thought recently 
a couple of months ago, like I was so obsessed with like the Oscars, for example, right? And I go there every year now. Like I'm always in LA for Oscars week. And I go, I was at the Elton John Oscars party, like all these things I would have looked at before. And like, I was so obsessed with awards. And now like this year when we had the Gossies, it was just so big and so GT. And I was sitting in the mansion house and I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, this is where I wanted to even get a chance to be. And now it's like mine, like I've created it. And there was a moment as well, like when I was younger, I was obsessed with Expose. So like when I was 14, kind of 17, I would have watched it all the time. And then like two years ago, I ended up getting a slot on Expose and I used to do an entertainment uh, thing like every week for a few months. And that was another moment where I was like, oh my God, like I literally was obsessed. I would have done anything to like get a job there and even to be working on it, it was, it was mad. So yeah, it has come a full circle. Yeah, it really has. It's crazy. It's like the power of manifestation or something like that. It really works. <laughs> I live by that. And I know everyone is very different about like what they feel about the secret and stuff, but I was given the secret by my mom when I was like 17, I think, and it honestly changed my life. And there's a million times where I've said I was going to do something and everyone's been like, it's never going to work. Like even when I was finishing college, so I was in Limerick, so I'd been in Limerick for like nine years and I remember saying to people, I'm going to try to get a do- job in a newspaper in Dublin. I'm like, sure, I knew no one in Dublin anymore. Like, I had no contacts. And so many people were like, don't bother. Like, there's no way, like, you're going to get a job there. And then I got a job in the Herald. So I was the only person in my whole uh, graduating class that had a job in a newspaper before we finished. So, like, I hadn't even done my exams yet. So I'm that kind of person when someone's like, there's no way you can do that. I'm just, like, 100% going to do it then. So definitely a lesson there is you know if you think you can do it just do it like anything is possible you know and then just going back a little bit to um the beginning of your career and how you kicked everything off um so you mentioned there you got a job in the herald kind of around your your graduating time or just before you graduated um can you talk me a little bit through that process of what what happened i guess leading up to you creating your own company so when I was in college, I did new media and English. And I remember on the very first day, the course director was like, the most important thing you do during this course has to do with work experience. Like you need to work on, like there were some people that were in it that kind of wanted to go down the advertising route. And she was like, you need to work on campaigns for people running for school president or whatever. You have to work at what you're doing because I'm sure you know this as well. Like when you go into media, you have to have experience. Like if you're looking to get a job, it really does not matter what degree you have. And it's the same with me when I'm hiring people. I don't really care what the degree is, to be honest. It's more like, what have you done? Do you have writing experience? Even do you have a blog? So the lead up for me was when I was in second year of college, I actually still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I when it came to college, I actually didn't want to do journalism. I wanted to do law. I completely oh, did a whole 180. Yeah, I went I went away from the whole creative stuff and I really wanted to do law, but I didn't get the points for it. So media and English was like my third choice. And I really didn't want to do it, but then I was like, I'll stick it out. And then in second year, we had to do um, a work placement. So loads of my friends went to Spain to teach English, but I just didn't think teaching English was going to help me get to my career. So I didn't really know what to do, but I ended up getting a placement in the Limerick Post newspaper. So they literally didn't want to have me at all. This is another situation where I just made it happen. Like they were kind of like, oh, we don't have the time to retrain somebody. And I was like, just give me a week. Let me see, like sink or swim. And then I ended up staying there for eight months. So I loved that. That was my first love really with journalism. So it was, it was a county newspaper. So like, you know, I'd be interviewing politicians and like, you know, doing features on weddings and motors and like cars. It was mad. Like, but I loved it and I loved the buzz of it. And I knew then that like, this is what I wanted to do. So after that, I went back to college. The placement was over, but then I got a job in Spin Southwest um, and I was their newsreader for about a year. So I kind of got that off the back of doing the Limerick Post. So when it came to finishing the degree and sending out um, CVs and stuff like that, I'd also set up like a blog back in 2010 called Miss Red blog. And it was basically an entertainment blog. It was like Perez Hilton, but like an Irish version of it. So I did that and I had like interviewed Laura Whitmore and Bo Williams, who were all kind of getting really big at the time. And again, I just kind of messaged someone. I was like, let's do an interview. So when I was sending things around, I literally remember going onto Google, trying to find the email address for like the Irish Independent, the Irish Times, like all these newspapers. And I sent everyone the same email. It was like my CV, cover letter, and um, the fact that I worked in the Lemon Post and Spencer West. And then I attached the link to my blog. And I literally was like, go have a look. So 
with the Herald, they were like, come down and have a chat with us. And then I, I went down and it was so funny. Like the person I had been speaking to wasn't even there. It was like the worst thing mm-hmm. ever. I arrived. Nobody knew to expect me. And they ended up just sitting me down at a desk. It was so weird. I didn't know what to do. They had read the blog and they were kind of impressed that I had interviews with like Laura Whitmore and Vogue Williams when it was just a random student with a random blog. Um, but they, I remember they literally just said, write something. They gave me no guidance. I was like, what do you mean? They were like, just write what you think is a story. That's all they said to me. And I remember I had seen on Facebook, this girl I knew in Limerick ended up getting the job of being a backing singer for Jedward in the Eurovision. This is how random the story is. <laughs> um, but I wrote that story and I had rang her myself. I was like, oh, can you give me a few quotes? And then I remember the head editor at the time, he, he hadn't even spoken to me that day, but he came over to my desk and he had this huge A5 sheet and it was like my name on it and it was a story and I was like oh that's so cool and he was like yeah that's page three tomorrow and then he literally was like when can you start so it happened that fast and yeah so that's how kind of it all started and I ended up writing um, in the diary then after that it's a very tough job because you basically are reporting every single day on all the events going on you're going to nightclubs you're basically out till four o'clock in the morning with celebrities and then the next morning you're back and work again like it was tough it was a really really tough job but it's kind of what started everything for me then because it was really hard work and I started getting to know everybody in the industry and going to gigs and going to events and yeah it was it was hard it definitely was hard but it was like my stepping stone to everything then really and what made you leave the Herald then because I know you did go on eventually to work in um was it the UK the mail. mail on Sunday did you, you did so Ireland the first and then the UK was that right so it was the mail here I only worked in the UK mail for a few weeks they just had okay. me over and um, but yeah they actually approached me they texted me someone texted me now I, I kind of wanted to leave the Herald anyway to be honest like I said it's a tough job it's not one you can kind of do forever um, and I had always said after 12 months I'm, I'll go somewhere else and literally the week I was there 12 months I got a text message saying like we, we have a job we think you might be interested in and I met them but the Mail Sunday was a funny one because Sunday newspapers are very very different to daily newspapers how you work and the method you do things are very different so in the Herald and even like Goss you'd be kind of like you know it's every hour writing a story every day it's like bang 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 when you're in a Sunday newspaper, you have the whole week to work on your story. So they want bigger stories, investigations, like it's much bigger. And I was 22 at the time when I was interviewing for the job. And I remember the like editor in chief, he was so skeptical of me when he met me. So I had to meet all these other people before I met him. And he was like, you can talk the talk, but I just don't know if you can walk the walk. Like he just didn't really believe that I could do all the things I was saying. And I was like, well, give me a chance. Um, and I remember I'd like asked for a certain money and he had said no. He was like, um, if you do what you're saying you're going to do in six months, I will give you that salary. Like I'll give you the promotion or whatever. And literally six months to that day, I won the Show Sternness of the Year Award. So I was like the youngest person to ever be nominated, let alone win. So I didn't think I was going to win. But I remember that night we all went for drinks in residence, which is now the Grayson. And we were sitting in the same seat and I was like, remember you said to me six months ago, I, I can't walk the walk. And he was just laughing. So I got my promotion then. Um, and then, sorry, after I won Showbiz Journalist of the Year, the man in the UK asked me to come over and shadow the editor, the Showbiz editor, and then run the run the um, Showbiz section for a whole week. So that was mental. The Mail on Sunday was definitely the making of me then because I had a lot more freedom there. I was able to be much more in control of my stories and do these bigger features. And then when I won Showbiz Journalist of the Year, I was only 22 then and I kind of said to the team there then, I was like, I want to be the show's editor. Like I want the next stage. Like I want more responsibility. Like I'm ready for it. Like I've just been named the best in the country. Like now is the time for me to move on like to the next stage. And they were just really reluctant. They thought I was really young and that like I wasn't capable, well not capable, but that it would be too much responsibility too soon, which really frustrated me. Cause I was like, how much more can I prove myself? I just won this yeah. award, like, you know, So that's basically when I started thinking about Goss. So when I'd gone over to the UK, they gave me like a team of four people to work under me and I'd never had that experience before, but it like worked really well and I worked with the team really well and I loved that feeling of like being in charge and coming up with ideas. So all of that kind of was the making then of Goss. So it's it's funny how it all leads into each other. When I set up Goss, it was 2014. I was in the mail, I wanted the bigger job, I wasn't getting it. And then I had offers from the mail in the UK and in LA for jobs. So I had these opportunities, but 
I was like, there's nothing like the male online in Ireland. And there wasn't at the time. There really wasn't. There was nothing that had hardcore showbiz entertainment news that was fast, that was that was accurate, that was exclusive. Like there was nothing like that here. And back to 2010, when I set up Miss Red blog, that, that was kind of the starting of what Goss kind of became in the end. Because that would be like that. Like I remember even Angie Jolie and Brad Pitt first got together. I think that's when I had the blog. I was like writing about that. I was like one of the first to kind of write about it. So... When I was setting up Goss, I was like, that's what I want. And trust me, like the whole industry was betting against me. Like so many people have said to me even now, because Goss is six years old now, but so many people still say to me to this day that like the first like two, even three years, people would be like, Goss is going to be gone by Christmas. Like people just did not want it to succeed or me to succeed. And like, I was like this 23 year old girl with a laptop setting up this thing that got so big so fast. And I think a lot of the big organizations, including the ones I used to work for, we're just not happy about it at all. Like two newspapers tried to sue me the first week we went live. Oh, so wow. yeah, there was a lot of like, they were scared. They were just scared mm -hmm. and they felt threatened, which I thought was nuts. Like I was just a girl on my own sitting in an office with a laptop. Like, but obviously now six years later, they're obviously right to be concerned. Like we are the best at what we do. Like I've no, I have no qualms about that. Like I know that for sure. At 23, you were so young and you had such huge ambitions, but as you say, you had all those people pushing against you the whole time. Did you ever suffer from, you know, a little bit of imposter syndrome or how did you deal with so many big heavyweights telling you no the whole time? Yeah. Oh, like I still suffer from imposter syndrome. And it's so funny. Like I know literally billionaire entrepreneurs that still suffer from it as well. Like it's just a thing, I think, especially as an entrepreneur, like I still it's just a kind of fear like I'm going to be found out like I'm actually really shit like I'm not good at what I do you always think that you always always think that and there definitely was a while where I thought I'm like no good at this this is all like I don't know it's a really tough industry people can be really hard on you and you can't easily buy into it but I think when I got the job in the mail and I started I was in a much better environment there and people were nicer to me and then I got nominated I started to realize I was like oh I'm actually really good at this like I'm actually really good like I would do a story and it would go everywhere and it'd get picked up internationally and all that kind of stuff was starting to happen and I was like okay I'm actually doing good but like even during those years there was a lot of problems like there was a lot of other journalists in the industry that really tried to like do me over during those years they just didn't like me there's a lot of backstabbing there was madness to be honest with you when all that stuff um when I was kind of at the height of it like winning the award around that time there was a lot of stuff going on but imposter syndrome I just don't know if that's something that will ever go away like but as you go on and more things happen the more kind of the more kind of problems you face and the hard times you go through definitely the thicker your skin gets so with goss because i think it's so interesting how how you grew it into such a respected um, media outlet for news that people you know go to to source their news because so many people try and do things like that and it just never no. it never crosses that line from being a blog to being mm -hmm. a credible news outlet and um, but you've done that yeah. so i'd be curious to know if there was any maybe strategy you approached it with differently this time to your first blog that covered entertainment as well and how you did bridge that gap between creating your website and then ending up like you said on the red carpet besides e-news yeah the big difference with goss to other things is that it never was a blog and that was the main thing from the outgo like it was it was a news organization like from day one like we ran it like a newsroom like it was literally like working in a newspaper so that's how I, I ran the site whereas you, there are other sites that have kind of popped up that are way more like blogs and even the way they write they'd be like oh my god gas blah 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 happened today like I would never write a sentence like that on gas so like I treat it like a newspaper that's how I treat gas and from the get-go that was exactly the way we wanted to be respected we wanted to have exclusives and I think a lot of those sites never do exclusives at all you know they would just kind of rehash the news and um, Whereas when we started Goss, we had stories ready to go. We had like big exclusives ready. And the thing is as well, to be honest, I had built up an, enough respect in the industry that when Goss launched, it kind of took off immediately. There actually wasn't really a graft in being credible. That kind of happened straight away because everybody knew me, like RTE, TV3, like 
the celebrities, the actors, the singers, like they all knew me already. So like, it was never questioned, like, what is this website? And I did think, I remember the night before we went live, I remember thinking like, are all these big events and premieres and press days, are they all gonna end now because I'm not with the paper anymore because now I'm on, on my own. But if anything, I actually think I was respected more. To be credible is, is tough. Like you really have to have experience. And this is the difference between blogs and an actual news publication because a blog can't really be verifiable unless you're a well-known journalist and it does frustrate me sometimes when I see pages or websites going up and I know that there's no journalists really behind it and it's just a kind of gossip page or you know they're sharing girly things but there's no like investigations going into stuff like even with us we say it all the time because sometimes we get comments like oh you know you just write and make up stuff. But like the level of care that goes into what everything we do, like we would never just randomly write a story and everything we do is verified, is double checked, you know? So it's very, that's the difference between us and someone else. Like we're actually a proper news publication. It's very different. And that's what I wanted from the start. I was like, we're running this like a newspaper, like this is being sold on the street tomorrow morning. We need to stand over every single thing we write. We need to make sure the content is interesting, that it's exclusive, that no one else has it. Like they were always the things that were in my head. Do you have an ultimate end goal for us? Such a hard question. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know there's there's two different outcomes like we've nearly been bought four times so wow there's been a few offers to buy goss but like the first one was only six months in to the business it was way too early and it was a newspaper who was trying to buy us but the last offer was two years ago the last serious one and I nearly did sell it like I had signed the paperwork and everything but it didn't feel right and I'm really glad that it didn't happen in the end um so that was something I was thinking about, but the other side of it is just expanding it and changing what it is really and growing it. Like, so having, see, it's hard to know what to do when all the coronavirus is happening, but having an office in LA, like making it a global brand, you know, there'd be a goss in LA, there'd be a goss in New York, like all that kind of stuff, goss in London. Um, and then just changing what we do a bit, like bringing maybe products into it. Like there's a lot of ideas that I've had making the daily goss more of a permanent thing like creating a proper show and like building a studio like there were kind of ideas we had before but again <laughs> because of this pandemic like everything has changed um so i honestly don't know what the future holds i think a lot of media companies have been really affected by covid and a lot of people have had to let people go and all that kind of stuff and we're lucky that like we've been in a really strong position but i never scaled goss to the point where we had so many employees and like so many office spaces and like all that kind of stuff we weren't at that stage so I'm lucky that we're small enough that it's okay you know we're doing good at the moment so at the moment I'm just like day by day making sure that we're still here and that we're going to get through the pandemic like that's kind of my main focus at the minute long term I think I'll probably end up keeping goss forever like I just can't see it anymore I can't see myself selling it I think I'll probably keep it forever but just grow it and have bigger teams and be able to take a massive step back like hiring a CEO so I wouldn't be the CEO anymore that kind of stuff that's kind of where I'm at but I do know for sure that like we would make a killing in LA especially like I've been there I go to LA at least like two or three months a year and I spend weeks there like we work over there we're at events reporting on things and I've seen it firsthand that like we could really go big there so let's see what happens with the pandemic if it ever ends yeah, yeah. we might properly set up there 2021 I'm sure you'll, 2021, you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and stepping away from the nitty-gritty of your business for for a second um I think anyone that follows you and I've seen it as well um online at the moment you've been speaking out a lot about um challenges you've faced being a female CEO and um you know criticism or double standards um yeah within that um can you speak a little bit about you know your personal experience of that and why you decided to start speaking about it online yeah I know it's kind of grown legs now it's hilarious like I've always been kind of known in the industry for like sharing like revealing photos like but it's so ridiculous it's always really annoyed me but like when I was working in newspapers it used to always kind of be sad like oh Ali needs to calm down like she's always posting stuff on Instagram and I just didn't really understand what the problem was and they weren't even that racy it might be like a low cut top and it would be me taking a selfie and so many people had problems with it and I just was like what is this about 
But it's really only been the last year or two where I've realized how much of an issue it is because it leads to so many other problems. But the basic idea of the double standards is I feel like women in particular just have it so difficult. Like you're, we're kind of told we have to dress this way and look this way. Like we need to look nice and wear makeup and wear heels. But then we also can't look too nice and we can't show too much skin we might distract men in the office or we might distract men on the street and women kind of are told to kind of keep themselves in check you know like don't wear something too revealing don't put yourself in danger you want to be taken seriously like that's something that's always been said to me and it's been said to me in workplaces before like you look classier with brown hair or you look really classy when you wear like a shirt instead of a local top like these things have always kind of been said to me and then a couple of weeks ago I put up a video a tanning video and I took a, took a video in the mirror and in the mirror you could see like a small bit of my ass like shock horror oh my god I have an ass and someone replied to me basically they were meant to send it to somebody else so they accidentally sent it to me but it was basically like the absolute state of her who she thinks she is that kind of thing and it really got to me because I was like we can all follow Maura Higgins who's like in lingerie and in a bikini and we're all like you're amazing but if you're a woman especially in business who's like being taken seriously or trying to be taken seriously there's this overall consensus that like you shouldn't be doing that like you shouldn't look like this you need to be taken seriously. I hate this idea that you have to cover yourself up to be taken seriously because it's absolutely ridiculous. Like one of the best examples I always think is Kim Kardashian. Like she literally got famous by a sex tape and now she's going to the White House. She's freeing people from prison. Like, you know, she is incredible. Like she's studying law, but like no one took her seriously at the start. And I love that she shares really sexy photo shoots because why not? Like it's her body. And like when I was in college, I studied a little bit of post-feminism and post-feminism is this idea that like women should be allowed to strip down and look sexy but it's for themselves it's not for the male gaze and I've always believed that like I don't put up photos in lingerie hoping that a man is going to like it like absolutely not it's just like I feel good I look good I want to share a nice photo and if I was a model and it was in a magazine I'm sure it'd be fine but there is this problem people have when you do it yourself and you put it out on your own social channels um, but like I said about many other things, when people tell me they don't like things, I kind of go OTT to do the opposite. So for ages, I was hearing that like a lot of people were saying my photos were way too revealing. So I started doing more and more of those photos. <laughs> so that's why when that girl had messaged me by accident, I was like, right, I'm doing a full, like I'm gonna do an underwear photo now. And to be honest, the reaction has been amazing because the problem with like gender inequality and double standards like that where women are expected to do certain things but men aren't and all this kind of stuff like so many people started messaging me being like I've had problems in work like people who've been harassed in work or people the opposite people who were told that they're not looking pretty enough they need to wear heels they need to make an effort and then I got loads of stories in about people that have just had issues with like harassment and I still think there's a lot of people that are looking at my page and they're bitching about it I know that for sure and they're probably like why does she feel the need to do this but I've always just been of the mindset, like, why does it bother you that I'm putting the photo of myself? Like, why is it a problem? And I do think it's very picky. Like, I think another girl sharing a photo in their underwear might be applauded for it. So it shouldn't really be any different for me. But yeah, no, it's it's been really interesting. And so many men have contacted me actually saying that, like, they've talked to their daughters about gender inequality and kind of the importance of I suppose loving your body and showing off your body and not being worried about what people think like a good few people have messaged me saying they've talked about it with their daughters after they've seen the posts and stuff like that which is really interesting because I didn't think guys are going to do it but clearly there's still a problem and like it's really important to me now the whole campaign I'm, I'm doing something much bigger with it in a couple of weeks now because it's just related to so many other issues but when it comes to the work side of things like as a CEO like take away the underwear photos I do still think gender inequality is massive. Like, and it's shocked me how bad it is. Like there's a lot of places we haven't worked with because the top of person there is a man and they are going golfing with a man in another publication. And like, that's how they're getting the deals. And I'm there struggling to try and get a meeting. And the only thing that makes sense is because I'm a girl. Like it doesn't make any other sense. Like they're going golfing together. They're going on trips together and we never get a look in. So it's really frustrated me. Like, unfortunately, a lot of the people at the top in this industry are still men. And if you look at the female-focused publications in Ireland, if you actually were to look into who owns them and who runs them, 
it's mainly men like we are the only as far as i'm aware we're the only theme we're the only news publication in ireland that's run by all women like i don't know any others and even in the world i don't actually know that many others so like every decision we make is made by women and the site isn't even just for women at all like you know there's a lot of men that read the site too but i think it's really important that I have a strong team of women and that we're going out there and that we're winning the same deals that men are winning because there is like a massive, it's, it's like a, it's like it's on a subconscious level. I don't think people even purposely do it. So there is this underlying problem. I see it more and more that as a girl, as a woman, there's so much expectations on you all the time. But I feel like if I was a man, it's the same with even, you know, the people would say like if a man is really stern, you know, they would, people would say, oh, you know, fair play to him, he knows what he wants. If a woman is stern at work, she's an absolute bitch. Like, mm -hmm. that's the difference. So it's so difficult to, like, find the balance of, like, you don't want people to be scared of you, but you also want to be respected and to earn respect as a woman. I just think it's so much more difficult. And that's why it frustrated me that, like, I was already battling, trying to get respect. And then on top of things, I was being judged for my clothes. And I was like, what has that got to do yeah. with anything? Leading on from that, I think it's so evident to anyone listening and to anyone that just knows you how much success you've experienced. And you're only 30, which is incredible, I think. Um, so oh I'd be really... In <laughs> no, you're not. You're so young. <laughs> um, I'd be really interested to know if you have a personal definition of what success means for you. Oh my God, that's such a tough one. I think success really is feeling proud of what you've done, to be honest. I think that's when you know you've done something right, when you can be like, I did the best of my ability and it worked out. You know, I think that's what success is. I mean, as I get older, to be honest, like success now is very linked to happiness for me as well. I'm kind of like success is waking up in the morning and feeling okay and your family are, are well and, you know, your business is doing okay. Like that it's a kind of an overall feeling of success in general because I think definitely entrepreneurs can get very much stuck in the rat race of success being money, how many employees you have, um, how much investment you have. A lot of it has to do with numbers, you know, and I've never really been like that. And like, there's been times I have been like, oh, we should be bigger and, oh, we should have more of this and, oh, we should do this. But to be honest, I actually don't think that's what success is. Like, for Goss in particular, like the brand as a whole is massively successful, as in everyone knows what Goss is. And when you hear the word Goss, you know what we do and you know about the Gossies. Like most people in the industry anyway would know what it is. Like to me, that's a success. Other people might measure success on like how much profitability happened last year. I'm not really like that because every year is different in business, to be honest. And like this year, God knows, you know, everyone's going to be all over the place. Um, but I definitely think it's, it's being proud. I think if you're proud of something and you know you did your best and it worked out well, you know it's a success but like everyone is different like success to someone can be a school teacher you know whose dream was always to be a school teacher and to have the summers with their kids like that's a massive success as well so i do think success has to be linked to being happy and you know if worst came to worst and something happened to us and it ended like it never will like i would sleep in my car before i'd let it go <laughs> but if it did i know that i made a success out of it if you could put your 10 year old self in front of you now today having been through everything you've been through in your career and also just life in general what's the biggest piece of advice you'd give that 10 year old self moving forward oh my god that's so crazy the actual thoughts that actually makes me emotional i'm like oh my god i was i was having such a hard time even at that age i would say to always believe in yourself and really not to care what other people think. That's been one of my biggest problems ever. But in saying that, I do genuinely believe my need to prove myself has made me very ambitious. So it's tough because I do think going through tough times when I was younger has helped, but I would definitely say believe in yourself and things are going to get better. Like I think when you're about to go into, when you're in school and you're going through teenage years, there's so many times where you think like life is shit or like things are really hard or you're never going to get to where you want to be. But even like sometimes I'm speaking to people who are doing their leaving search and they're really stressed about getting their results and stuff. And I'm always saying to them, like your results mean nothing. Like everything in life is possible. Like, you know, and I'd love to go back and to say that, like, you know, you're amazing. You're going to be incredible. You're going to, you know, achieve all your dreams. You just have to believe in yourself and know the good things are coming. And I think that's important for everyone to think, to be honest, no matter what age you are. A lot of people, even friends of mine, would be really down and out about like relationships or 
work situations and I'm always like just leave like just take the leap and that's the difference between an entrepreneur and someone that is an entrepreneurial is the taking of the taking the risk like you know if you're hearing someone saying they're in a bad relationship and it's not going well like why are you still in it and that's how I kind of talk to people now about their jobs and stuff if they're like I don't like my boss and I wish they're doing this I'm just like why don't you start your own or why don't you move to this company or but people are always kind of in their own little comfort zone bubble I think it's so important to just if you're that unhappy with something to go and change it and life is so short like it's so short and this pandemic I think has really shown people what's truly important and being happy and doing what you want to do like if your dream is to swim with dolphins in Australia like go do that you know you don't have to be here working in an office nine to five but then again if your dream is to be the best sales manager in an office working nine to five then do that as well like I think everyone has different things that they want but I think we all need to talk to our 10 year old selves and that'd be fab if we could just go back (laughs) you're so uncertain and everything doesn't seem possible and you really care about what people think and all of that kind of becomes important when you're that age but I honestly care less about what people think now than I ever have and it's been so freeing and I would recommend it. <laughs> yeah I know I think that's like a lot of I asked that question to everyone and a lot of people have said that is the thing they would say is yeah. just to not care um because for so, uh, maybe it's social media now I don't know as well that feeds into that so much but oh, um compare what is that saying like a comparison is the thief of joy or something like that and, but it's yeah. so true but it's so oh, hard not to do it I don't know yet how to and especially with it. like you said social media has become so toxic like I've been the victim of all this stuff like I've seen threads about me and stuff like that and it's crazy but th- that's what I mean thankfully I actually don't care anymore but it took a good three years of having to sit through that and bawling my eyes out and actually reading all these lies about me and stuff and it takes so long to get to the point where you're like it actually doesn't matter like I know my truth my friends know my truth my family know my truth and to be honest that's all that matters at the end of the day Mm -hmm. no it's so true well I just want to say thank you so so much for giving up your evening to chat to me and share your story Thank you so much for listening and as always, please rate, share and leave a comment if you like what you hear. And don't forget to follow at what it's like pod on Instagram and Facebook. To read Goss, visit the links provided in the show notes and keep up to date with them by following at goss.ie. I'll be back next week with more inspiring stories, but for now, this has been What It's Like with Luce.